Brothers and sisters, on behalf of the consistory, I have the following announcement. The consistory will meet tomorrow evening at 7.30 p.m. This afternoon's call for wor to worship is taken from 1 Chronicles 16. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the world is established, it shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. And let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let's rise to receive the greetings of the Lord. We confess that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. And he greets you, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's praise the name of the Lord with singing Psalm 8, verses 1, 3, and 5. Commune with the Church of all times and all places. We will confess our Catholic undoubted Christian faith. We will do so with the words of the Apostles' Creed by singing hymn one.
alle dir in Prayer. Gracious God and Father, we thank thee that we can be in thy house for the second time today to worship thee, the holy God. And Father, we may come here, yes, we could come here, without any fear of being condemned by thee because of our sins. Lord, when we think about it, that we could come here without any fear, we marvel. For so often we fail in loving thee. Worse, at times he willfully transgress thy commandments. And yet, thou wilt look upon us in mercy. And that's not because of us. That's only because of the work of thy son, Jesus Christ who came into this world to die for us, establishing peace, not as the world understand this, but peace that we as thy children may live once again under an open heaven where we have access to thee and may call upon thee as our Father. Lord, this afternoon in the preaching, thou will teach us that to understand the riches of this redemption, First, we must learn the seriousness of our sins. So that our thankfulness for this redemption will never be superficial. Lord, when you listen to thy word, the danger is there that we just go through the motions. Because we know the gospel of salvation. We have already heard so many sermons and the basic message that comes across is almost always the same. Being saved by grace alone in Jesus Christ. And then it can happen, Father, that standing in awe for the miracle of that gospel is no longer there. And as a result, it can also happen, Father, that throughout the week we don't live accordingly either. And so we pray thee, grounded by listening to the gospel this afternoon, it may, create, it may create in us a renewed desire to serve thee in sincerity and truth with our heart, soul, and mind. May that be the fruit of this afternoon's preaching. We need to, as Father, both in speaking and listening, bless our worship also where we may sing our praises, give our offerings of thanks in the collection. Lord, we pray that we with our people wherever they come together today, all over this world. May thy word grant comfort amid the trials of life. You remember those places where there, is op- where there is no opportunity to come together, or only in small number due to the COVID-19 pandemic the restrictions so much in place. We think about churches in Canada, in the Netherlands, and other places, Father. Grant what is needed, as in those circumstances. Lord, we also pray for those who are persecuted. We can hardly imagine what it means, it's the freedom we have. And yet so many places where there is suffering, where people are tortured, imprisoned, and killed for thy name's sake. Lord, be near, give perseverance. Be near also to family members who have left ones in prison. If it's thy will, Father, grant relief from suffering. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. This afternoon, we will focus on Lord's Day 3 of the Harbour Catechism. We are still in the path of our misery there, the Lord's Day 2 through to 4. And the collection is that Lord's Day, we will read from Genesis and from Romans, and in response to the reading of God's word, we will, read Psalm, we will sing Psalm 51, verse 2, 3, and 4. We turn first of all to the book of Genesis. 
Genesis 1, the verses 26 through to 31, speaks about God making man in his image and also about the cultural mandate. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I've given every green herb for food. And that was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Then we turn to chapter 3, and we come to the fallen to sin. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Let's now turn to Paul's letter to the Romans. Chapter 5, verse 12 through to 17. Verse 12, Therefore just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned, for until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense death reigns through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ.
Let's now turn to our confession. Lord's Day 3 of the Harbour Catechism on page 519 of your Book of Praise. Lord's Day 3, the second Lord's Day in the first part of our sin and misery. Did God then create men so wicked and perverse? No, on the contrary, God created man good and in his image, that is, in true righteousness and holiness, so that he might rightly know God his creator, heartily love him, and live with him in eternal blessedness to praise and glorify him. From where then did man's depraved nature come? From the fallen disobedience of our first parents, element Eve in paradise. For there our nature became so corrupt that we are all conceived and born in sin. But are we so corrupt that we are totally unable to do any good and inclined to all evil? Yes, unless we are regenerated by the Spirit of God. So far, our confession. In response to the sermon, we will sing from Psalm 116, the verses 5, 7, 9, and 10. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord's Day 3 deals with the bitter reality of sin and the consequences it carries also for us. So if you think about the Lord's Day we just read, it's not such a uplifting subject, you may think. Especially when this Lord's Day finally concludes that there is no good in us whatsoever. And that's because of our own fault. For many, that is too hard to swallow. About 30 years ago, a daughter of a reformed professor in the Netherlands, a professor who taught me Old Testament, his daughter, 30 years ago, her father had already passed away by that time, wrote a little booklet in which she said that this doctrine as confessed in the Harburg Kerkism can lead to severe depression. And the title of that booklet says it all. The title read, Helpless and Guilty. And there have been enormous amount of prints of this book because many people struggled with this issue. Helpless and yet guilty. Would that not cause you to despair? And so for some it might even lead to severe depression and all this because of their faith. The author calls this the paradox of the doctrine about our salvation in Christ paradox of our salvation, of the gospel of our salvation in Christ. Lord's Day 3, a depressing sermon, a depressing Lord's Day. But beloved, that's only so when you read this Lord's Day in isolation, without considering the context in which it is placed in the Harbour Kerkism. From Lord's Day 1, we learn that to enjoy full comfort in Christ and so to bring us to glory again, we read what Christ did for us. But that also means that we have to understand what Christ did for us. And that is to see the greatness of our sins. I could also phrase that as follows. To know how great a Savior we have First, we must understand what he has saved us from. We speak about amazing grace. But beloved, that amazement will only be there when we see first the darkness of our sins. Hence, the dark colors pictured in Lord's Day 3 serve to show the brightness of the light in Christ. By way of example, if you want to see a beautiful rainbow, you need also dark clouds. 
or once you will never see that rainbow. So that's how we should read Lord's Day 3. Lord's Day begins with telling us how beautifully God had everything created, creating man in his image. And then we read about the mess we made from it by our willful disobedience. But note, that's not how this Lord's Day ends. Through the last answer of this Lord's Day gives a very grim picture. After the dreadful event in paradise, we have become totally unable to do any good and are inclined to all evil. Totally corrupt. Unless. Unless. Unless a miracle will happen. But we love that miracle did happen. In and, in and through the redemption Christ obtained for us. The miracle of new life for people who deserved eternal death. That's the gospel which we see even in this Lord's Day about sin and misery. Still good news, glad tidings. But then only when we see what miracle was needed for that. And so I've summarized it as follows. To fully appreciate the greatness of our redemption, first we must learn how deep we have fallen. And then we'll focus, first of all, on God's willful creation, about, secondly, man's willful disobedience, and then also we will listen to God's response to that willful obedience of man. So let us first read, of, let us first focus on how beautifully God created everything. Question six, brothers and sisters, must be read in close connection with what we confessed in answer five. Concerning the fallen man in sin, terrible things were mentioned there. It says there, I am inclined by nature to hate God and my neighbor. You may think, is it really that bad? And how come? Whose fault is that? Well, that brings us to Lord Stage 3, which deals with that specific question. And then, first, we look at God, asking, is perhaps God to blame for this? Did he create man so wicked and perverse? You may wonder whether we can put a question like that. Is it allowed to let a question like that cross our minds. How did, the dare, how did the authors of the Heidelberg get us dare to put a question like this? My beloved, surely not because they regarded the fact that God had created men and wicked and perverse as a real possibility. Surely not. Of course not. Just imagine. But why then did they put that question? Well, the simple answer is the authors knew all too well that some people indeed do think this, refusing to accept own responsibility. People like you meet them also today who say, I can't help that I'm like this. I'm not a product of my own making. If there is a God of whom people confess that he is almighty, well, then why then does he make sure that things in this world go a bit different. If he is the almighty one, why is there still so much misery, hatred, killing, you name it? Why doesn't God stop it? Well, it's questions like these, brothers and sisters, which the Catechism wants to address in Lord's Day 3. And that's why that question is put. Did God then create men wicked and so perverse? It puts this question trying to help us responding in, to questions as I just mentioned them. Now, if you look at the answer, it should be noted that the Catechism does not come with some in-depth dogmatic reasoning about the source of evil, but it simply gives an answer of faith, saying firmly, no, God is not to blame. It's impossible that God would do this. He created man good and in his image. 
God created man good. That, that doesn't mean that it never could go wrong with man. History has proven that. The opposite was there. Man did walk away from God. So that's not what the word good means, infallible or so. Now the word good means that man was created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. Not that man somehow looks similar to God, but God created man in his image so that he was able to reflect the characteristics of God. Holiness, righteousness. With these characteristics reflecting God's image, man was to represent God here on earth. God's representative here on earth. Just by way of example, a, a son can look like his father. A spitting image. You have to sometimes you put the two together, it's a spitting image of his dad. But it might also be that he doesn't look like his dad at all. But the way he does things is exactly how his father does it. Well, that's how we have been created in God's image. Like God is righteous, so man was created righteous. Like God is holy, so man was created holy. That's how man became God's representative on earth. And that not just at particular moments, like in prayer, meditating on God's word, but in all daily activities. In other words, when speaking about man creating the image of God, it points not only to specific talents God had created man with, but it points also to what man had to do with these talents. That's why we read Genesis 1, what sometimes is called the cultural mandate. When God says to man, he blessed them, he said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living, living thing that moves on the earth. So man had to work with the talents God had given him as God's representative here on earth. Now, to mention one example how that works, then I think of how Adam carried out that task by giving names to all the animals, Genesis 2. Adam did so on God's behalf. And then God's wisdom becomes transparent in Adam weighing the pros and the cons and making choices. And then we read that God did not disapprove of one name. We read in Genesis 2 verse 19b, whatever Adam called every living creature, that was its name. And it was not because Adam had such a good knowledge of the animal world. No, it was because Adam knew God so well. He arrived precisely at those names which God approved of. You could say in the name giving of these animals, something of the invisible God became visible in Adam's actions. Well, all this clearly shows what God's aim was in creating man in his own image. Not just generally that man would look well after creation, but more specifically that in doing so man would glorify God. God looks for people who know him heartily, love him heartily, and who honor him in all that they do, heartily willing and ready. Through God's presence in this world in many ways, all of creation speaks of God's power, of God's power and wisdom, even without man. The heavens declare his glory, Psalm 19. In Psalm 148, sun, moon, stars, fire, hail, stormy winds, fruitful trees, cedars, all the beasts are called to praise the Lord. But we love it far richer than a beautiful garden, far richer than an impressive sunset, far more impressive God wants to make himself known and recognizable in man's action. God created man good. And that is the high responsibility to serve 
and glorify him. God created man in his image, that is in true righteousness and holiness. That also means in paradise, man lived and walked according to God's holy law. God, man kept all God's commandments perfectly. And he did so out of deep love for God. The two go together. Holiness and righteousness. That points to this, knowing God well, man has also the desire to live accordingly. And so, to praise and glorify God. Now that's exactly how answer 6 speaks about man created in the image of God. That he might rightly go, know God as his creator, heartily love him, live as him in eternal blessedness, and praise and glorify him. So did God then create man so wicked and perverse? By looking at man's wonderful beginning, how God wonderfully created man in a living relationship with him, it becomes clear that in no way we can blame God. Just read Psalm 8, we sung that psalm. It gives a poetic commentary on what happens in the beginning. When God created man almost divine, giving him rule over all things. How wonderful is God's name in all the earth. That's the conclusion of Psalm 8. But brothers and sisters, creating man in this, this highest high position, giving man such a great responsibility, to a certain extent, if I may say that for a moment, it also involved a risk, since man also could choose against God. That seems almost impossible. Since God, so to speak, had attuned man in great detail to walk with him, attuned so perfectly that it should never come that far, that man would seek a life outside God. There was no need for man to give up that intimate bond between God and him. So, why would man do this? Moreover, God had also put two trees in the garden. Two specific trees, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life taught men life can flourish only in communion with God. Whilst the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which God had forbidden men to eat from, and you should not eat from, you, you, you will go wrong. If you decide to eat from that tree, you will die. If you eat from the tree, surely things will go wrong. At times, this command which God gave to man is called the test commandment. But it should be clear that this commandment did not aim so much as to test man, but it served as a warning, as a warning of love. By way of example, if you drive along the coast, down south, really along the coast, then you see many signs, beware of dangerous coast. If you go to the Gap, you have many signs there. Don't do it. It's for your vis physical well-being to listen to this command, because this is a dangerous coast. Well, likewise, God's commandments are for our good. And that's how also this prohibition not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil was a command of God's love. Adam, Eve, don't do that. I love you so much that you should not eat from it because it will go wrong. So man, God had warned man beforehand so that he could enjoy life with the Lord and this in full respons responsibility, but indeed, he could make a different choice. But he knew the consequences beforehand. So God is in no way to blame. But, so the catechism goes on, from where then did man's depraved nature come? 
You know, it's, it's nice to know how God created everything beautifully in the beginning, but in the meantime, we suffer from a lot of misery. And if God meant it all so good, where did it go wrong then? Now, for an answer to this question, once again, the authors of the Heidelberg Catechism take us back to paradise, to what happened with our first parents, Adam and Eve. How they became disobedient, rebelled against God. There indeed lies the origin of all misery where we suffer from at the moment, the consequences. Sometimes the question is asked, but could God not have prevented this? Why did he not create man in such a way that man had never fallen into sin? After all, God knew beforehand that things would go wrong. That's God's plan of election. So, God knew beforehand that things would go wrong. Did he, did he perhaps use sin to prove the greatness of his mercy? As some people have said it. God wants to show the greatness of his mercy against the dark background of sin. Is that why God did it? These are questions, beloved, which are on the borderline of being improper. Whereby, again, one may ask, are we allowed to ask questions like these? Is the danger in these questions not that we try to call God to account, or even worse, still try to blame God? But again, that's not the intent of the Harbour Catechism. Even more to the point, to a certain extent, questions like these, brothers and sisters, we find even in Scripture. For example, may I refer to the book of Job. Reading this book, basically, we see Job struggling with this very same question. Throughout almost 40 chapters. But then at the end of this book, God reveals to Job his majesty in creation. God is God whose ways are beyond our human understanding. This means there comes also a time that we should stop asking questions. And that's what we read in Job 42. If you turn with me to Job 42, the first one through to 6. Job Job argued with his friends, but he also struggles with God. But then in the end of that book, Job's fe Job feels so small. There is nothing left of all the questions he asked God. It says there, then Job answered the Lord, after the Lord had revealed his greatness. He said, I know that you can do everything, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I didn't know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said I will question you, and you shall answer me. I've heard you by the hearing of the ear. But now my eyes see you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. That's not left of Job after he had seen the greatness of God. Who are we that we can call God to account? The Almighty One, about whom we read in Scripture, God is light and there is in Him no darkness at all. And so it's incorrect to say that God used sin to show the greatness of His mercy. How can He who is completely holy ever be the author of sin? But how then did sin enter this world? How did sin enter this world? The question itself already shows, brothers, is that evil was not there from the beginning. Evil is not from eternity. God is from eternity, but not evil. At a specific time after creation, evil entered this world. A world which initially was completely perfect. From scripture we know that it all started in heaven. When one of the angels no longer wanted to bow before God. One of the angels, so a creature. A creature who contended with God. That's where it all started. 
And then other angels, angels joined in this rebellion against God, no longer being content with the position God had given them, them. And that shows, brothers and sisters, that evil plays always havoc with what initially was good. You see that also today. Think of merits. How wonderfully God has created merits. So beautifully. If you read scripture, it's, it's amazing. And what does the devil do? Same sex merits, same sex merits, transgender. But it ruins society. I read once that all cultures, someone had made a study of all the cultures of this world, and his conclusion was that all cultures that have given up on merits, as God instituted it, have all gone to ruin. Look at the Roman Empire. The things are the same as today. What's left of it? So, evil always plays havoc with what God initially was made good. And that's how Satan, having not succeeded in heaven, turns to the earth, trying to do that the very, very same thing. Playing havoc with what's created good, twisting the truth. And that, that's how it goes. It sounds almost, you say, well, how could he ever ask a question like that? The serpent, serpent was more than cunning, any other cunning, more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Has God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? That's a stupid question, you would say. Of course, man could eat of any tree in the garden. But the point is this, as I read somewhere, with this question, Satan focuses on God's prohibition instead of speaking about God's provision. And why does Satan do that? He wants to try doubt in Eve's heart. That's how it always goes with sin. First, the devil comes with something in our mind and we say, oh, or maybe it's not too bad. Yeah? And then from there it goes. Well, that's what Satan did. Casting doubt in Eve's heart. And the next he defames God's motives. He denies the truthfulness of what God had said. Satan presents it all in such a way if God had reasons for saying this, because he, didn't do, he did not tolerate any competition. Beloved, when there is a genuine loving relationship, then it will never come into your mind. If I read in scripture that a wife should be submissive to her husband, and if in that you do that in the wonderful relationship as God has created it, then it would, and, and, and merits flourish, flourishes, then it would never come up in the, mind, in the mind of a wife who loves her husband, and her husband loves the wife. Is there any competition? I want to be like my, like my husband. I, I, what is this for a strange relationship? Maybe, and there it goes. That's the devil. But if there is a good, loving relationship, then it's not there. Yet Eve still gives in. And next he also makes Adam eat from the tree, from the fruit of the tree. And then their eyes are indeed opened. But it does not better their position, they had hoped for. Instead of their high position under God, it changes it in an impossible position without God. That's how it all started. Man no longer trusted God. You turn to Article 14 of the Belgian Confession. It says it in a beautiful way, or describes it in a beautiful way. Article 14, I read the first paragraph of that article on page 504 of your book of praise. It says there, we believe that God created men of dust from the ground, and he made, them, made and formed him after his own image and likeness, good, righteous, and holy. He will could, his will could conform to the will of God in every respect. And then he have it. 
But when man was in this high position, he did not appreciate it, nor did he value his excellency. He gave ear to the words of the devil and willfully subjected himself to sin and consequently to death and the curse. For he transgressed the commandment of life which he had received, and by his sin he broke away from God, who was his true life. He corrupted his whole nature, and by all this he made himself liable to physical and spiritual death. Pride, it says in Proverbs, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Well, beloved, this haughtiness was the cause of all the misery that followed. In other words, it did not start with eating with Eve eating from the forbidden fruit. It started already earlier. It started already earlier when she considered in her heart that the tree was desirable to make one wise. James writes it in his letter. James says it starts with the wrong desire. And then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Sin is rebellion against God. That's what we read in Genesis 3. Rebellion against God's goodness, against God's wisdom, and against God's justice. Rebellion against God's goodness. Since Adam and Eve are allowed to eat from every tree in the garden, apart from the one tree, the whole garden was for them. But they still rebelled against that goodness of the Lord. They rebelled against God's wisdom. They thought they knew better than God. And finally, they rebelled against God's justice, asking more than they had a right to. That's Genesis 3. But then we may, then we may ask, what do, I, what, do, what do we have to do with this? How can God keep us accountable for what Adam and Eve did? Why all these miserable consequences for us? In answer 7 we read, that because of this dreadful event in paradise, our nature became so corrupt that we were all conceived and born in sin. It started with Adam, who was created in the likeness of God. But after the fall of sin, man, Adam received children in his own likeness. If you turn with me to Genesis 5, Genesis 5, verses 1 through 2 3. It says here, this is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them, male and female, and blessed them and called them mankind. He called them mankind in the day they were created. But then verse 3. And Adam lived 130 years. He begot a son in his own likeness, after his image, Seth. That's Adam. But one may ask, is it fair that we inherit Adam's guilt, are even punished for it? After all, how can I be punished for my father's sins? If my father steals, the judge will not send me to prison. Can he? But the Lord also says that. I'm not punished for my father's sins. I'm not punished as such for what Adam did in paradise. I'll come back to that a little bit further. But first of all, the Lord says in his word, the soul that sins, sin shall die. If you turn with me to Ezekiel 18, where it comes up. Ezekiel 18, verses 1 through 4. Ezekiel 18, the word of the Lord came to me again saying, what do you mean when you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel saying, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Ezekiel prophesying to the people in exile. These people are you know, complaining. Our fathers, yeah, they rebelled against God. 
But we haven't done anything wrong. The fathers have eaten sour grapes, they rebelled against God, and now they are complaining because our children, our teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the son, as the soul of the son is mine. And then it says, the soul who sins shall die. So, I die, when it ever comes to, to when I stand before God's judgment seat, then I can say, yeah, but my father, but the Lord says, the soul that sins shall die. Of course, as you know from the second commandment, the sins of the fathers do have consequences for the children. That's true. But the children have their own responsibility. And that's no different when God counts us accountable for what Adam did. In this context, sometimes this, the word hereditary sin is used. But can one inherit sin? Can one inherit guilt? And it's here that I would like to come back to Romans, 12, uh, Romans 5. Let's go to Romans now again. Romans 5 verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin, through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus spread to all men, because all sins. There's a certain tension in this verse. On the one hand, it reads that it happens through one man that sin entered the world. But at the end of this verse, it says, because all sins, and both are true, and that because of our unique relationship in Adam, with Adam, God looks at humanity in its totality. For example, what it means in practice, I refer to Psalm 51. The psalm David had made after he had committed adultery with, with, with Bathsheba and had killed Uriah. How could this happen? The life of a man who lived so close to God. When David thinks about it, he says, it's because I was brought forth in iniquity. I was conceived in sin. There lies the source of my sins. Now, in mentioning this, David is not trying to shift the blame, so from, I can't help it, my mother was sinful, and that's how I came in this world, sinful. No. David claims full responsibility for what he did. But at the same time, he points to the source of it all, saying how deeply sin was rooted within him. It was not just an accident. David could not say, well, I'm, I'm not like that. If you look at me, I would never do that. But unfortunately, I was there on that rooftop and I saw this lady and then it went wrong, but basically that's not who I am. No, David says it came from here. It was not just an accident. I'm sinful at the root of my existence. Article 15 says, that sin is a root that produces in man all sorts of sin, a woeful source from which sin continually streams forth like water welling up. So be careful, beloved, when, when you see someone and he goes completely off the track, that you say, I would never do that. I could do that. Your minister here on the pulpit deep down is like Samson who went out with every harlot in town. By nature I'm the same. I would never do that, but could. By God's grace I haven't done it. But it's not because I'm so good. But God kept me on his ways. Thank God Thank him for his grace by which he keeps you safe, but never look down on a sinner in the church. Stand next to him and says, say to him that grace is also for you. I think that's, that's also for us all, but also for office bearers. How do we do that? And I don't mean that in a, in a negative way, but 
I believe it's office bearers of the home visit and they say, well, you do this wrong and you do that wrong. And I know that. I came once to someone and said, don't come here. The minister comes. Well, the minister, see what he has to say. He said, you don't have to tell me what you do wrong. What, what are you wrong? I said, I know that. You don't have to tell me that. He said, I know, you know, I'm not going to tell you that. But I come here sitting next to you to tell you that we all need God's grace. I and you. And the start is that. And it gives you a totally different perspective when you talk with people in the discipline. Because we are all the same. I have that woeful well here. And that springs up. And if it by God's grace doesn't come to sin, that's not because I'm so good. But God is so good for me. I also like to say in the end that ultimately we will never be able to completely make clear how we all sinned in Adam and also be the consequences. But then flip the coin, so to speak. For likewise, it is a mystery that through one man's righteousness, grace came to us. So instead of asking all questions to God, how he can hold us accountable for Adam's sin, rather glory in God's mercy, that because what Christ did on Calvary, God credited to me. Is that fair? Yeah, if you look at Adam, then you say, that's not fair. But then you should say the same when it comes to Christ. That's not fair. But then we don't say it. See what a wonderful God we have. Amazing grace. Let us then also accept it in grace, in true humility. So we have seen how God created everything beautifully, what mess man made of it through willful disobedience. And so, next the catechism comes with the question, is it then really, really so bad? And the simple answer is yes. That also shows we should never try to minimize the depravity of man. Nevertheless, the catechism doesn't end on this dark note. Because there is also that little word, unless. In other words, there is an opportunity for restoration, but not from within. Not from within us. We have to seek it outside of ourselves. It will only happen by the powerful work of the Holy Spirit. Only God can give us new life. God created life. He can also recreate it. And that's all God's work. And God does so by the preaching of the gospel. And that's not like the remonstrants say it and the Armenians say it, a bit of gentle advice to persuade men morally that's what you should do. You know, that, that's how it goes in, in those churches, the minister preaches, and then at the end of the service he asks, who wants now to come to the front and want to commit his life to Christ? That sounds great. And then people come and they tell about all their own feelings and whatever. But beloved, I can't give you faith. And you can't do that yourself either. It's not like, it's not like what the... What the Arminians say, it's a bit like, how do you make a baby crawl? He will do it on, on himself. But you have to put a ball in front of him. And if you put that ball, just wits out, re that he's not in reach, but just, then in the end he will crawl on itself. But that's not how it goes with the gospel. The work of the Holy Spirit is tremendously more. Let's turn once more to our confession. And now to the canons of the Lord. Chapter 3, 4, verse 11. How God does that. Chapter 3, 4. How, bring, how God brings about conversion. Page 577 on the bottom of that page. God carries out his good pleasure in the elect and works in them through conversion. In the following manner, he takes care that the gospel is preached to them and powerfully enlightens their minds by the Holy Spirit. 
that you may rightly understand and discern the things of the Spirit of God. They have to give, brothers and sisters. If God did not enlighten your spirit this afternoon, you wouldn't have a clue what the minister was talking about. It's not about the pastor minister if he has all kinds of good preaching skills. Forget about that. It's the Holy Spirit that has to enlighten our minds. And then by the efficacious working of the same regenerating spirit, he also penetrates into the innermost recesses of men. He opens the closed and softens the heart's heart. Circumcising that which was uncircumcised, instills new, new qualities into the will. He makes the will which was dead alive, which was bad good, which was unwilling willing, and which was stubborn obedient. He moves and strengthens it so, like a good tree, it may be able to produce the fruit of good works. If you look under the proof text, you have there also Acts 16 verse 14, and it's about Lydia. Lydia, who was there listening to Paul, and then it says there, the Spirit opened her heart so that she gave, so that she gave heed to what Paul was saying. If the Spirit had not opened her heart, she would never have done that. So that's how God works, causing us to give us a new life, free from the slavery of sin. In Article 12 of the same chapter, it reads that, that one cannot think highly enough of that work of regeneration. It is, as it says in that article, not inferior to creation or raising someone from the dead. That's what it is. There is no place for any free will of man. Entirely God's work. And in the end, it remains incomprehensible. Article 13 of that same chapter. If this, in this life, believers can not fully understand the way in which God does this work. Meanwhile, however, it's enough for them to know and experience that by this grace of God, they believe with the heart and love their Savior. That's Lord's Day 3. Helpless and guilty. Remember the title of the book? None of them, neither of them is right. For a start, we are not guilty. God has set us free from the guilt. So I'm no longer guilty. And I'm not helpless either. The point is, and that, that's also something we have to, to be aware of. It's God's work. Sometimes we all struggle, and I think all of us, maybe some will not, but as I can identify with that at least, all of us at a certain point of, point of time in their life struggle with this question in their mind. Will I really go to heaven? Have I lived my life good enough for the Lord? Put that question out of your mind. For if it is, if I lived my life good enough for the Lord, I never go to heaven. And that's why it says, seek your life outside of yourself. God will work the good works I have to do in me. That's God's work. If I go out and love my neighbor as myself, that's not because I'm so good. That's God's work. That's regeneration. That's Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that Christ died for me, a wretched sinner. Amen.
let's give sex. Lord, we thank thee for the opening of thy word. Help us now to work with it, to the glory of thy great and wonderful name. Help us to realize that this, that this is the purpose for which thou hast created us, to worship thee in all that we do. A life of worship in living our faith, not because of what we do, but by rejoicing in the powerful work of the Holy Spirit, making our faith active in thy service. And therefore, Lord, help us that we never grieve thy spirit, trying out our own ways, but that instead in genuine thankfulness for all that thou hast given us in Christ, we want nothing else but serving thee with our whole life. Lord, help us to hold on to that glorious gospel of thy incredible love for us sinners. And grant that this gospel may give us joy amid the trials of life. Trials because of the brokenness of this life. Lord, help us in all circumstances to cling to thee and so find peace amidst the difficulties. Lord, Help us so to live in thankfulness, for sometimes life may seem quite okay, that there are no specific trials. And then, so easily it can be that we forget to thank thee. Lord, let that always be first in our prayer, that we thank thee for thy goodness, thy mercy, every day. Lord, be with so many who do not know about thee. Open eyes, so that people may turn to thee and find peace in Christ. Make, to, this end, make, to this end, Father, make us shining lights, so that we make, may see the opportunities when thou gives us these opportunities, that we do not feel ashamed to speak of the hope by which we may live. Lord, we also pray thee, will thou bring back those who have left us. Grant repentance to those of the discipline. Lord, that grieves thee when children of thine go their own way. Do not want to listen to thy wholesome commandments of life. Grant willingness, Father, to work with thy word. We pray that, Father, also when there are struggles in merits or other struggles. Let's turn to thee, Father and lay our life without holding anything back before thee, asking for help. And thou wilt give what is needed in accordance with thy great faithfulness to which we may cling. Lord, that's how we may start a new week with thee. And then we think also of the schools that start again this week, Father, for the second term of this year. Lord, we thank thee that we have no COVID restrictions, that it work can be done different than last year. Also in this, we see thy grace. Be with the students, make them faithful in doing their work, rejoicing in what thou hast given them also in the talents with which they may work. Be with the teachers. Lord, give them compassion towards the students. Be with the board, the councils, in the country, Father, where also our schools are under attack. It has become more and more difficult to, to have a curriculum that indeed is still supportive to the government so that we can subsidy, can get subsidy. It can also go away, Father. If we really have to stand up for what we believe, merits, and all these issues, it's transgender and so, and if the government presses it to put that in the curriculum, Father, then it can become, can become very difficult. And so give wisdom to the board, the councils, to guide our schools in the right direction and make us as parents supportive and pray for that. Lord, this afternoon we also want to pray for our Queen for her, for her children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren in this time of grief. 
Lord, also that is a family with a lot of turmoil. But the grandfather is also there. They may see that to make it all right, they have to turn to thy word. We pray thee that our queen may find comfort. Also when this week she has a birthday, Father, many widows and widowers can, can empathize with that. They give you birthday on your own. That loved one no longer next to you. Lord, we need to our queen. Give her what she needs, also when she will take up her work again. Surround her with thy love, and will thou provide for her. God of all grace, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You now receive the opportunity to give to the Lord your gifts of thankfulness, and in conclusion, you will sing hymn 80, the verses 1, 5, and 6.
receive the blessing of the Lord and depart in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.